2020, the year of anxiety, overwhelming despair, and video games. This year has been tough on a lot of people. It was the perfect storm of political unrest, economic hardships on many, and of course, public health issues. <clears throat> so when we look out our windows and see the metaphorical and sometimes literal flames of destruction engulfing our nation, at least many of us can calm ourselves with some good old video games. Come on! Come on, you bitch! Pussy on the fire! Fuck you! Or not. The continued quarantine has given me more time to work on my own well-being, but more importantly, given me some time to catch up on my backlog. I played quite a few games this year. Some were brand spanking new, and others had been sitting on my hard drive when I finally dusted them off and said, Yeah, okay. Here are some of my spotlight picks. I had picked up this game years ago as part of an indie game bundle. Ever since then, it has sat in the back of my library, probably collecting digital spiders. I never really had a big desire to play this game, or so I thought, because when I picked it up, I could not put it down. When you enter a room in this game, you usually have nothing more than your bare hands and maybe a small perk. Everything can kill you in one or two hits and enemies can see or hear you from a mile away. Sounds punishing? Well, it is, but when you knock down your first grunt and pick up his gun, it all snowballs from there. Shoot a guy, lure the others into a choke point and mow them all down, chop them up with knives or slam a door in their face and crack their neck. Did you get killed? Doesn't matter. Do it all again and again and again until you're the only one left. Then walk out the way you came and observe the destruction you just caused. This game is hypnotizing. It's part puzzler, part action shooter, and part murder fantasy. And by the end of it, I was wondering what the point of it all was. And I like that. A special shout out goes to this game's soundtrack. Equal parts energetic, psychedelic, and it knows the right times to chill and pick up the pace. And with that, let's take a hard left into this next game or should I say, group of games? Ooh, sorry, didn't mean for that much thematic whiplash. But seriously, this game kept me going this year. I had never played Crash or Spyro for any significant time before this, and during the Steam summer sale, I had enough to buy either this or the Crash Insane trilogy. I chose Spyro probably because I think dragons are cool, and I think I made the right choice. It's not especially challenging, barring a couple janky segments, and the story is pretty cheesy in a Saturday morning kids cartoon sort of way. Spyro has a glide that can provide some cool moments, but where this game really shines is in its level design. Collectibles are hidden in every nook and cranny of these open or looping spaces, and as you explore you can find mini games and power-ups which gives each level a new life and allows the developers to hide items in places you never would have thought of before. This game is also absolutely gorgeous. At times I would just stop and admire the lighting and set pieces. It really felt like I was playing an animated movie from DreamWorks or Pixar. This next one I may need to explain a little bit. If y'all know me, you know I've played Sonic games for most of my life. Sonic is like comfort food to me. When I boot up a Sonic game, I know what to expect. A game that may have some good ideas, but is ultimately let down by poor design decisions and a good amount of glitches. Sonic Riders is no different. This game has a weirdly high difficulty curve when first starting out. There are so many mechanics that this game doesn't tell you about, even if you watch the tutorial video, which is hidden in the extras menu for some reason. I'll be honest, when I first started playing, I liked its sequel, Zero Gravity, way more, because I thought it was much more accessible. However, the more I played Riders, the more depth I found. Pulling off tight turns and landing tricks just right was immensely satisfying. I kept playing more and more, and eventually I was destroying every race. 
I even did the mission mode to unlock extra characters, and mission modes and racers suck. But I kept playing, and I haven't stopped yet. I know this isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I think this game deserves some more credit. And besides, this way I'll be able to keep my eyes on you. Oh, Tails? This next one was without a doubt my most anticipated game of 2020. You may know what this is already, but if you don't, allow me to introduce you. When this game was announced earlier this year, I lost my shit. I legit thought Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was dead after the fifth game. So I was taken off my feet when I checked YouTube that morning. A remake of the first two games by acclaimed developer Vicarious Visions? Yes, please. I had been waiting on an in for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for years. My dad and I would play the original on the N64 all the time. The only other one I had was 4 for the GameCube, but I couldn't play it all, and I wanted a more modern experience. When it finally came out, I went to my campus's local GameStop and bought it day one, even though I didn't have my PS4 on campus. I actually used my friend's PS4 next door, and probably more than he used it himself. Sorry about that, Tomas. Nice ollie, though. Anyways, uh, I should probably get into why this game is so addicting. Well, to start off, the combo system is like nothing I've seen in any other franchise. Every level is a playground, and the combo system allows you to play on it in an infinite number of ways. You could conceivably use every single obstacle in the park in a single combo, but one slip up and it's all gone. It's that high stakes gameplay that keeps me hooked. How long can I go before I mistime a kickflip or slip off my manual? <clears throat> There are some players who can go on for millions upon millions of points in a single combo, and I love watching them too. Oh, we got it, dude. Yeah. Woo! Also, everyone knows this already, but the soundtrack is legendary. Too bad you can't play it without going to jail these days. Okay, okay, I'm done talking about Pro Skater, but if I ever stop going out for a long period of time, you know why. These games have helped me through a lot of different situations. Whether I needed to take out some aggression, de-stress, or just feel like a badass, I've had some great games to cover me. But there's only one game that has impacted how I see the entire medium from that point forward. I've covered it before, so you all know what it is. It's... I actually avoided Undertale for a while, even after it first came out. I thought the fan base was super cringy, and it led me to believe the game was way overhyped. I still think it was, and the fan base can still be. <sighs> but let me be clear, that is not the game's fault. A friend of mine who was also initially critical played it on the Switch a while ago, and after said playthrough, switched tunes and started singing praise. And that made me think, maybe I should finally open up my old save, and boy am I glad I did. The best way I can describe it is like this. Have you ever played an RPG and thought that no matter what decision you make, the story ends pretty much the same? Given some minor changes, the villain always dies or the planet is always saved at the end. Now throw that all in the trash. Every decision you make, big or small, has an impact and can wildly change the outcome of the story. There's dialogue for literally every situation. Certain characters act differently or may not appear at all. It's not just the small stuff either. Depending on your actions, you, the main character, can either be the hero or the villain of this story. You have almost full control. That is the backbone of this game. Add in quirky pixel art, a bullet hell style combat system, loads of charm, and a great soundtrack, and you have Undertale. It's not a ginormous game. You can beat one run in about six to eight hours but it's the variety that kept me coming back to see it all. To get the full experience of Undertale, I would triple that time. That may sound monotonous, but trust me, you won't get bored. By the end of it, my outlook had changed. I had some more understanding for why the fanbase loves this game so much, and still does five years after its release. Okay, may maybe not that much. I had fun with all of these games this year. They helped my 2020 be a little less shitty, and I think for that they deserve some attention. 
Also, I'm curious as to what your picks would be. Uh, you can tell me in the comments down below, or, you know, you can just Discord me. It's not like anyone new watches this shit anyway. I'd like to quickly mention a couple other games I didn't get to talk about. The first being Among Us. I know this game has been digitally beaten to death by now, but I did genuinely enjoy playing it with friends. It was great for bonding and finally getting revenge on those who have wronged you. And yes, I genuinely do believe that it deserved best multiplayer at the game awards. No other game comes close, okay? Also, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, I just finished that recently on my Twitch and I had a great time with it. It hasn't had much time to sit with me, so I don't have much to say except that it was gorgeous and it was a positive experience. And that's it from me. If you made it all the way through, I want to give my sincere thanks. It means a lot to me that people care enough to sit through my dumbass talking for this long. If you want, you can subscribe down below or somewhere on the video right now. There's also a link to watch my genocide playthrough of Undertale. It's one of my favorite series on this channel. Uh, I also stream on Twitch every now and then, linked below. And yeah, thanks again for watching. I'll be gone for a little bit, but um, I'll be back eventually.